Kathmandu. Situated in the valley is the capital city of Nepal. Shut off from the outside world until 1951, it has a population of over 550,000. Only the size of a small urban town and yet the poorest in the world. Despite this it retains a fascinating charm of narrow streets, ancient temples, for both Buddhist and Hindu, and the diverse culture of friendly people. Tamil is the heart and soul of the city. You can find everything from trekking equipment, budget hotels, restaurants, souvenir shops, and some of the best bars in town. Roughly 350,000 tourists visit Nepal each year. A third of them are Indians and over a quarter are trekkers and mountaineers from every continent. Pashu Patanath lies on the banks of the sacred Bagmati river, just four kilometers northeast of Tamil, and is one of Nepal's great pilgrimage sites. The Bagmati, which flows into the sacred Ganges, is believed to purify those who bathe in it. The stone platforms are cremation ghats, as Pashu Patanath is considered to be an auspicious place to die. The two-tiered temple of Lord Pashu Patanath, built in 1696, is Nepal's most sacred Hindu shrine. <laughs> Pashu Patanath, with its many temples and religious monuments, has been designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Richly decorated Buddhas dominate the steps that lead to the ancient site of Swayampanath, the Monkey Temple. After walking up a steep 365 stone steps, we arrive at the two and a half thousand year old site which for centuries has been an important centre for Buddhist learning and is one of the most ancient sites in Nepal. Visiting pilgrims and Buddhist monks are often seen praying in their own extreme ways. The spinning of prayer wheels seems to be a more attractive option and less painful on the joints. The central stupa, Swayampanath, is situated on the Patmachal Hill as a height of 10 meters and circumference of 64 meters and it represents the four elements earth, fire, air and water and the painted eyes of the Buddha gaze out from all four sides symbolizing the eyes of the all-seeing and all-knowing Buddha after our two initial days of sightseeing around Kathmandu we finally board our twin otter plane for the 40 minute 
flight to Lukla, which will be the start of our adventures. And to add excitement to the flight, our landing was on a runway that lies on a 1 in 10 upward slope on the edge of a 9,000 foot mountain. This tiny airstrip at Lukla was constructed by Edmund Hillary in the 1970s. Here we meet our assembled cast of trekking Sherpas, including our Sirdar Ang Perba. Our trek takes us into the Kumbu region and heads northwestwards with an initial descent through the fertile Dukosi Valley. Following the Dukosi River until we reach the village of Pakding. Three hours later, we reach Pakding. At Padding we came across a Maoist checkpoint and had to pay 1500 rupees, equivalent to 12 pound. The Maoists came politically active in 1996 by becoming a revolutionary force to unseat Nepal's monarchy and to establish a new democracy. After our first night's camp, we woke to the sound of builders chipping away at stones, shaping into house bricks, and began our steady climb to Namche Bazaar, passing many farms and settlements, waterfalls, and numerous traffic jams on the way. We continue our ascent following the Ducosi and crossing this majestic river many times on exciting suspension bridges laden with prayer flags. Sagamartha National Park is run by the Parks and Wildlife Conservation and is an exceptional area with dramatic mountains, glaciers and deep valleys dominated by Mount Everest. After our final torturous ascent, we arrive at Namchi, reaching an altitude of just under 12,000 feet. We can certainly feel the air thinner now. Namchi is the most important Sherpa town and a former trading centre with Tibet. Situated in a large natural basin, 2,000 feet above the Dukosi River, Namchi is the place to stock up on supplies for the many treks that are done from here. Oh, 
Of course, our campsite had to be a 20 minute trek to the top of the basin. It is here we stayed for two nights to acclimatise before heading up to higher elevations. The next day after breakfast we headed up to a nearby hill to reach the Japanese built Everest View Hotel. The view from the hotel's terrace gives a commanding panorama of the Everest range of mountains. After two nights at Namchi, we continue north to our next campsite at Portitanga, stopping to look at the Everest Memorial at Monk. After six hours trekking from Namchi, we finally arrive at Port Zitenga. This was to be Simon's last night with our group as the effect of altitude defeated him, which resulted in him being helicoptered out back to Kathmandu. A typical morning on trek consists of bed tea at 7am and half an hour later we are given a bowl of hot water to wash and shave in. Today we leave Machermo and head over the Machermo Kola Pass into Panka which lies in the Gokyo Valley.
Leaving Panka, after some initial ascent, the trail gradually levels off and we reach our first lake, Long Ponga So, in the Gokio Valley. After about an hour, we reach the final lake, the Dude Pukari, which is situated next to our camp in the beautiful Gokio village. At 16,000 feet, the air is extremely thin and altitude problems can easily debilitate any fit trekker. Colin was our next team member who has been feeling altitude sickness for a couple of days now. And it was at Gokyo where he made the call to descend back down the valley. And Colin's brother, Roy, accompanied him together with a Sherpa. <laughs> Early that evening it snowed quite heavy, which seemed to bring out the local carol singers. After an early start, we make our way up Gokyo Ri, directly above the village of Gokyo. A stiff three hour climb on a snaking path from the Du Pokari leads us to the summit of Gokyo Ri at just under. Well, here we are on um, Gokyo Ri, and it's Tuesday. I think As we can see, Everest to our east at over 29,000 feet, and to our north, we can see Chouou, the sixth highest mountain, at just over 26. Makalu is the fifth highest in the world at over 27,000 feet. <laughs> you think I'm joking when I say I'm talking knackered, don't you? <laughs> you got a smart on me. After a spectacular morning spent on the summit, we drop back down to Gokyo for lunch and a short rest before we head down along the Gokyo Valley to a camp at Dragnak. We retrace our steps back down the valley and turn east at the second lake to cross Nepal's longest glacier, the Nugzumbi Glacier. Our camp lies a tough three hours trek away at the little village Dragnak. After a hearty porridge and chapatas and eggs, we were fueled up for the steeper scent of the shola.
Ascending the Shola was quite energy draining, having to kick in the, the snow and ice. But eventually, after four hours, we all made it to the Shola's snowy plateau at a height of 18,000 feet. An impressive Le Bourget East, towering at 20,000 feet. That's the mountain we summit in a couple of days. Namaste. <laughs> We crossed the Shola Plateau in single file, so as the snow was more compact, and hopefully limit slipping down in a crevasse. Eventually we had to scramble down loose rock to reach Zonkla. Okay, after glacier walking up and across the shoulder we descended on different terrain this time, steeply on rock to Zongla, which is situated at a lower altitude of fifteen and a half thousand feet. <coughs> After another outdoor breakfast, our porters did their usual fine jobs of taking our tents down and after the yaks were loaded with our kit bags, we continued to our next camp near to Le Boucher village. And again, the porters didn't waste any time in erecting our tents. It was quite exhausting just watching them. After a relaxing morning, we ascend to Le Boucher's high base camp. This leads to the shoulder of the mountain, where we will establish camp at 5,500 meters, just over 18,000 feet. The camp is perched below the south face of our mountain with the clear summit of La Boche in clear view. So there's Wynn and Allison now and the porridge and noodle soup before they make the final summit, summit bid up La Boge East. After a 4am wake up call, we fueled up with porridge ready to tackle the vertical slopes of La Boge East. <coughs> 
From the end of the hidden lake, using crampons and ice axes, we climbed beneath the main glaciers to the ridge overlooking Le Boucher, and then following the snow ridge to the top, reaching a height of 20,000 feet. We descended back to high base camp, by the same route, heading towards the hidden lake. At breakfast, Everyone is still excited and reflecting on our epic achievement on the Bolshev, including both Sherpas and Porters. After walking or climbing up We leave Le Boche base camp and descend southwest to Dinboche for our next night's camp before heading east to climb Island Peak. We stayed at Perrache for a well earned rest and an opportunity for washing our clothes. Nah, it's wash day morning, Monday, Monday the 30th of October. And Dave is going to give us a Lonnie Donegan number now. <laughs> <laughs> My old man's dusty. <laughs> My old man's dusty. Got the bars, bars. We then headed to the village of Dimboche and headed east along the valley to Chukung, 
which was our final stop before reaching base camp of Island Peak. Island Peak towers prominent in our approach and lies central in a sea of glaciers. Leaving Chukong, we head along a ridge to Island Peak. After a four hour trek along the ridge, we arrive at Island Peak Base Camp. <laughs> Tibetan snowcocks, who are members of the pheasant family, can be often found at heights above 15,000 feet in the Himalayas. Our summit day began with a 3 a.m. wake up call, so the only light we had was from our head torches. On reaching a stone plateau, we donned our crampons and then began climbing on glaciated terrain and using fixed ropes to ascend the steep slopes. Amadablam can be seen in the cloud. After a 14 hour day, we arrive wearily back at base camp. We leave Island Peak and retrace our steps back to Laboche with the mighty island peak behind us now. It's nine o'clock, Saturday the 4th of November, and Dave's looking forward to going to Pangboshe. Look, no. Pangboshe. <laughs> I'm going to 
far now. It's the last glimpse of Island Peak before we leave from Dimboche onto Pangboche. And the track will continue past farm settlements, and a cobbled little street. Street? It's more like a sewer. Following the sewer. Open. Well, open right east room. To Pangwishe. Next stop, the monastery. Following the Imjikoli River, we leave Dimboche and head southwest to Pangboche before continuing along the river to our camp at Pangboche Monastery. We arrive at Pamboche's monastery, founded in 1667 and containing old wall paintings and Tibetan manuscripts. High above the tree line is Tengboshe Monastery, which we will camp for the evening.
At almost 13,000 feet, to the south of Everest, Tengboshe Monastery is a famous centre of Buddhism. It was the first stop of Sir Edmund Hillary's before he ascended Mount Everest. Teng Boshe is set in a magical setting that commands impressive mountain views, including Mount Everest. <laughs> Poser. <laughs> right the scenery changes yet again as we leave Temboshe to walk through woodland, heading towards Porti Tenga, stopping on the way at a tea lodge by the Injakola. Ang Perba and our Sherpa Dandy. We then continue to Porti Tenga and then stop for a while at Ang Perba's tea lodge, where his wife and daughter have a display outside of interesting jewellery and Nepali crafts. We couldn't pass there without grabbing a bargain. We then tried Ang Perba's Chang beer, which might go down well with the natives, but I don't think it can catch on in the UK. We then continued to Kumjung Monastery. The monks highly revere the Guru Rinpoche, who is regarded as the second Buddha who brought Buddhism to Tibet in the 8th century. Among the monastery's many strange deities and ancient manuscript lies the strangest artifact of all, the Yeti skull. Whether the Yeti exists will remain one of the many myths and legends that will keep attracting the tourist. Kumjung has the largest school in the Solo Kumbu, fundraised from Sir Edmund Hillary's Himalayan Trust. And in the adjacent town, Kundi, also has a hospital, again funded by Sir Edmund Hillary, who was also involved in the building of it in 1966.
Amchi Bazaar is a bustling town teeming with Sherpa life. With its many shops, restaurants, bakeries, hotels and even the Sherpa Life Museum and it still continues to grow. New hotels are constantly being built. Okay. After our final night in Namchi and gambling our last yak, we retraced our steps back down the dusty dirt track, following the Ducosi River back to Lukla. Retracing our steps along the Ducosi, it was quite interesting to see how quickly buildings were erected. As three weeks ago, this lodge was in its early stages, and now look at it. After six hours trekking from Namchi Bazaar, we finally arrive at the end of our three week trek at Lukla, where it all began. stayed one night at a lodge in Lukla before our early morning flight back to Kathmandu. This was an emotional time where we said our farewells to our Sirdar Angperba, our Sherpa Dendi and all the porters and kitchen staff who all helped in making our trek a memorable and enjoyable event.
Back in Kathmandu, we stayed three nights in the Marla Hotel before moving on to the Kathmandu Guest House in the heart of Tamil. The infamous Rum Doodles Bar has the largest collection of signatures of every summiteers in the world. Travellers, trekkers and climbers also leave their mark on footprints. including some that reflect the mood that most of us feel during some part of the trek. Good information. To see many in Patan. Durba Square Outside in Patan is the religious and social heart of Kathmandu's old city and is a complex of palaces, temples, shrines and courtyards built between the 12th and 18th century.